Hebrew Israelite influencer, Dr. Kelly Richardson, is bugging about the Trinity. What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, the real Adam Coleman. Y'all know what it is, man. True ID apologetics. And we are back in the game one more game, man, with, with my dude. Yo, you, you're like the you definitely have to be the most frequent frequentest flyer uh when it comes to, to true ID, man, on, on the true ID airways. Alfredo Valentin, how you how you feeling, bro? I'm doing well and, and I appreciate the, the frequency in which I'm able to be here at True ID. Thank you, sir. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I, I know you just hopped off of, off of your own channel uh, recording the joint, man. What, what were you talking about on there? Uh, well, you know, uh, Jabari Osase, once again, is critiquing uh, the Christian belief using pseudo sources. And I have to, um, you know, let them know that, you know, please stop doing that because <laughs> you're looking crazy out here. <laughs> look, look real crazy. Look real crazy, man. Yeah. I, I feel like he's just been a treasure trove of um of content you know what i mean <laughs> he's, he's the, the gift, gift that keeps, that keeps on, on giving, giving. He, he really is if, if the gift that keep that keeps on giving was a person it would be jabari osaze at least as far as apologetics goes i mean obviously uh we did several uh yes. response videos to uh the debate that he had with uh dr bantu some years mm -hmm. ago mm -hmm. uh he's made uh time after time you know he's, he's made uh, a sundry pseudo scholarship claims you know particularly regarding the historicity of of, mm -hmm. of jesus and so forth and so i know you've been on that um you, you know step by step debunking those things uh yes, for sir. some time man and i, I want to say i think did you have david falk on this episode or was, was that a different well one? not this one but um okay okay the last one i did have dr david falk i had i had him look at some clips of jabari and, and he had some some words for for what he saw so, oh okay yes he had words okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah words all right all right yeah well i mean hey you know anybody watching this you know i'm gonna put a link in the um in, in the description of my video you know, as soon as you finish watching this video hop directly over to uh bk apologist and check both of those out you know it's, it's, it's some potent stuff man but um uh, speaking of treasure troves of material yes sir. um we, we got another one but more so in the hebrew israelite community a, a gentleman who goes by uh you know dr uh kelly richardson mm -hmm. right um you know i i had a fairly recent uh, exchange if you will <laughs> you know on, on on facebook that that den of evil you know uh, uh called facebook you know we're, we're all <laughs> pseudo scholarship goes to flourish uh, along with youtube and everything else man dr kelly Richard, you, i feel like you know more so about him than i do i, I actually i haven't met him in actually person. i i really don't he's oh, you know, one, okay. one of the hebrews that i haven't really really dealt with i mean i know of him but this is the first time i'm really engaging with any kind of his claims that he's made Okay. So, okay. Gotcha. But what's what's funny with you though, and we said this before we restarted. Um, right. You know, Adam isn't a frequent participant in Facebook threads, but the times that he does participate, they get real <laughs> interesting. <laughs> it gets it gets hectic, man. It gets very hectic. Yeah. It gets hectic. You know it. So you know it, it's true. I, I don't really spend a whole lot of time on Facebook. I mean, usually, I mean, I, I post stuff about you know like my family and sports and things like that every now and then. But as far as I, I don't really engage as much um, on social media in regard to um, apologetics debates because, to be honest, I, I find myself you know days on end going back and forth with somebody. I was like, man, I could have recorded like three videos for all that. You know what I mean? So I'm right. <laughs> yeah, I might right, as well right. you know, focus on, on what I'm doing. But uh. I, I do seem to have a talent for for you know uh, hopping into the fire a little bit you know at least at least when it comes on com, comes to social media, yep. um, but but this time to be honest with you, bro, like I, I didn't really see it coming, man. Like you know, um, you know, Dr. Kelly Richardson, I, I guess would you say it's fair to say that he has positioned himself maybe as being like a, a Hebrew Israelite scholar, like that's that's kind of how they Absolutely. would look at him. In that community right absolutely i mean not only is he considered a, a scholar but he's a a pastor of sorts he has his own congregation right you know so he's definitely somebody who's out here 
uh, articulating a Hebraic, in his mind, a Hebraic perspective on God in the Bible. So, right, right, right. You know, so he's definitely a no notable guy. You know, uh, I met him back in like 2018 ish, 17, 18, something like that. At the, uh, he was actually at the Frequency Conference. You know, um, uh, in Philly. Uh, along with another gentleman from the Hebrew Israelite uh, community. And, uh, you know, there, I mean, from what I recall, it was a relatively short interaction, but it was very cordial. You know, it wasn't, wasn't no beef or anything like that, you know, right. and we had actually talked about at that time, you know, catching up for, for lunch because, you know, we, we don't live uh, that far apart. And then, you know, fairly recent, I want to say maybe, I mean, certainly within like the last four to six months, you know, we had had some, in some interactions on, on Facebook that I thought, we're, we're pretty cordial. And we had actually talked about, you know, we had DM'd a little bit back and forth, um, making plans to catch up for lunch and, and just kind of discuss theology on cordial terms and that sort of a thing. So I felt like we had uh, a pretty positive rapport, um, but apparently he just doesn't like public disagreement. I mean, he, he, he said some things about the Trinity, which I know you got the slide, so we, you know, I guess we can get into that, but like he said some things about the Trinity and he made a public <laughs> statement that I thought was false. So I hopped on the thread, you know, right. and it, it went kind of, it went left <laughs> pretty, pretty quick. Right. And, thought, and, 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 and it starts very cordial. In fact, you are actually agreeing with him at first. Right. Just an actual, your, your first interaction with this particular post that I'm going to show is you actually agreeing. Right. And, right. and we'll, we'll show the people what we mean. Um, let me just share my, screen yeah why are you bringing that up i mean i you know i'm not gonna lie I, mean, I know you know sometimes i mean i have strong convictions like i mean i don't you know make any uh i'm not trying to you know shade that or i mean i definitely have strong convictions i, I feel very strongly about doctrine and things of that nature but right. i thought i was keeping it pretty light in, in, in my mind i felt like i kept it pretty light but you know i guess we'll and, and again we'll you was in agreement right you know and um so shout out to abu abu actually has the archived this thread yes so I, I got this from abu so so shout out to abu shout out to my guy abu yep so all right so it starts off with uh happy birthday baby father jesus this is the the delusion christianity slash catholicism teach and celebrate during christmas how can christ be a baby and the father at the same time christ is not the father right right and you, you respond, I wholeheartedly agree. Christ is not the father. In fact, not a single well-studied Trinitarian believes that Christ is the father. If this post is aimed at those of us who affirm the biblical doctrine of the Trinitarian Godhead, then I'm afraid you've missed the mark by a mile on this one, bro. Now, you see, it's right. the second. It's your second statement that got you in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. All right, all right but see, but it, like, go back one slide. I'm, I'm explain why, because because I know sometimes I can come off kind of spicy. I'm, I'm not even gonna lie. You know what I mean? <laughs> but 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 I try to temper it as best I can. But I mean, let, let me say this. So first of all, when I'm reading this, right, the first line, "Happy birthday, baby, Father Jesus." So like, he's being funny, right? Right. He's obviously being sarcastic, right? And then he, he follows it up by saying, "This is the delusion." That Christianity right. slash Catholicism teach. So, like when, when you when you start off sarcastic and then you add this word delusion, which I take to be a very strong word. I mean, you're saying mm -hmm. that people who believe this, you know, are delusional. And and I'm interpreting it as you know, you're really coming at the Trinity, you know, Trinitarian doctrine in, in general. Right. Um, because th that's like what he's articulating here is a very typical um Hebrew Israelite critique of Christianity. Right. So you know, when, when you use words like delusion, that, those, that's strong language to me. So I feel like at that point, all right, cool. If, if that's how you're carrying it, then you should be open to somebody else engaging you along those lines. Like I, I shouldn't have to pull punches as much, right. you know, um, if that's how you're coming off. But nevertheless, um, you know, it, it, you can go back to, to that next slide. I feel like I put it in as soft as terms as possible. I'm, I'm starting out with agreement. I wholeheartedly agree. And I made sure that I put if between two asterisks because you know, i'm really trying to couch it as look i'm not accusing you of, of saying this and that if which means i could be wrong but if this post is aimed at those of us who affirm the biblical doctrine of the trinity then you off yeah i, I, I don't i, I don't think, know how i could have but put it much softer i, I think that. the contention is you actually providing the possibility 
that he might have missed a mark. I don't think he wanted that option presented to him. Right. You know, I, right. I think that's the, the issue. So anyway, but after you say that, Kelly responds, the city proverb, quote, throw a rock into a pack of dogs, whichever one yelp is the one it hit. The Trinitarian doctrine clearly makes a distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, that doctrine has major flaws as well. Let me make this clear. I believe in the Father, His Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is actually called the Spirit of Yah. I don't believe that the Messiah is a lesser divinity. So no, I'm not practicing nor promoting Gnosticism. Now that's off the table. I don't believe in the Trinity, which is completely not biblical, starting with your flawed diagram and the deceptive usage of the word Godhead. I will not endorse the Nicene Creed. Okay. <laughs> so, so, all right. So here's my thing. You're not going to endorse the Nicene Creed, then you're telling me, you, all right, so you just reject, reject the orthodoxy. That's, that's how I'm hearing it. You you just letting everybody know. Yes, I reject orthodoxy. Okay. Um, that being said, I thought it was interesting. I, now I don't know. Maybe he's had some interactions with others that that brought up Gnosticism or something like that. But I never said anything about Gnosticism. Right. So I don't know. So, so when he says he's not uh, practicing or promoting Gnosticism and says that that's off the table, it's like, well, it was never I didn't, on the I, table with you, right? Right. I never put it on the table. So like, you know, what are, what are we talking about right now, right? Um, but he does mention th this diagram, and, and I don't know if you have it or, or I could I could bring it up either way, um, and, and kind of just get clarity in terms of what he's referring to. Yeah, hold on for a minute. Let me um, actually let me um, okay. Uh, do 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 do, and it's here. There we go. Yeah, right. So, so just to kind of add a little point of clarity, what he's referring to is, uh, in addition to that first statement that I made, I also posted uh, this diagram here. You know, which you see this all over, all over the place. You know, mm -hmm. it's just uh, uh, um, a drawing, if you will, or, or a diagram of, you know, broadly speaking, what you know Christians are referring to when they talk about the Trinity. We're saying that there's one God who exists as three persons. So, you know, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is God. But it's not the case that the son is the father or the father is the son or the, the son is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the father. Like, you know, we make those distinctions. And so I posted this in addition to um, my agreement statement, you know, that, you know, we don't believe that the father is the son. Right. right. And so I just kind of put this as a visual representation. of it. So that, that's what he's referring to, um, you know, with the uh, what he refers to as my flawed diagram. Right. Right. So. But um, what I also find interesting is he believes in the Father, his Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right. But he doesn't believe in the Trinity. Well, at least the way we Christians articulate the Trinity. Correct. Right. Which actually, funny enough, I feel like a lot of Hebrew Israelites would disagree even with what he's saying here. Yeah, I mean, I guess that'd be true, right? Because you have some who are Tanakh only, right? Right. So, so they wouldn't, you know, rock with the sun in that regard, I, I would think. Or even believe that, um, he says, I don't believe that the Messiah is a, is a lesser divinity. So Jesus and God, he sees them as having the same amount of divinity. A lot of Hebrews would disagree with that, that Jesus was even divine. Right. You know, so right. even that statement would put him uh, in opposition towards many of his um, Hebrew brethren. I mean, that's a good point, because if he's saying that, I mean, again, he's positioned himself as being some sort of, you know, Hebrew like scholar, you know, wh whatever that might mean. Um, and it, you're right. It does seem to me that the, the average Hebrew is like walking around would probably disagree with him on that one. And, and, and the reality is, and, and honestly, as I was reading that, I'm like, I don't even really know what it means to say that you believe in the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, which is called the spirit of Yah. Like, what, what, and you don't believe that Jesus is a lesser divinity. So at least the father and the son are, are co-equal, I guess you would have to say, right? Right. 
Right. So, so now you're binitarian, I guess. <laughs> you know, but then you know, th- but it's still a mystery here. In terms of well, actually, he's more than binitarian. It, it, the problem isn't that it should only be two. Actually, it, it, his his understanding gets you know the training gets, gets a little right. crowded. Right, we shall see. Right. So, but um, so let's continue here. Let's keep going. Your response. Uh, seems like you misused that proverb, bro. As I stated in my previous post, if you are making, if you are, if you are taking aim at Trinitarianism and the OP, then I say it's a pretty clear miss. If you had some other target in mind, then so be it. That aside, would you mind being specific about what you believe to be flawed about the diagram I posted? Fair enough question. Right, it's about as nice as Adam gets. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all these guys nice. it's, 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 I'm keeping it pretty chill. I'm no, you are pretty chill. You are right, right, right. And then Mr. Richardson responds to Adam, "Define God," which is interesting because in the previous thing, you're asking him, you're requesting more information, so you're asking for, you're making a, you're, you're, you're asking a question, right? And instead of answering. He asks you a question, right? So it's right. already problematic, right? right. So. And so, and to be honest with you, when people do that normally, and this is just kind of like a, a, a tip if you're involved in these kind of conversations, typically I don't let people get away with that. You know, like if, if I ask you a question, then typically I'll do one or two things. Either I'll say, well, hey, I asked you a question. Would you mind answering that first? Right. Or if, if anything, I might just, you know, if it's, if it's something I can answer quickly, I'll ask the question. I'll answer the question and then reiterate my my question. I, I switched it up a little bit here because prior to this exchange, we'd had you know multiple DMs where we had a positive rapport, right? And I'm I'm not trying to keep keep it spicy, so I'm just kind of playing along for the sake of keeping it cordial, you know. But right. typically, I don't let people get get away with that. Right. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a deflection. It's an obvious it's, deflection. Clearly, clearly, right. So your your response is I'm using the term God. To refer to the one and only maximally great being, that being is revealed in scripture by the name Yahweh. Right. His response, again, let's try this again. (laughs) Properly define God. Yahweh has a separate meaning. Define this transliterated word God, got, and then define the word it transliterates from. Right. Now now he's in, he's into so has an a linguistic argument now right right which again right. he hasn't circled back around to my question um and he's going off into saying and at this point i was like okay so you know clearly he has some argument in mind and right. what he wants me to do is to definitely play into it you know right that, that's that's obviously what's going on yeah and you reply there's nothing improper about how i define god all words have semantic range uh etymology alone with respect to a word's origin isn't the sole determinant of a word's meaning slash semantic range to understand what someone means in using a particular word god or anything else context and clarity from the speaker matters you asked me to define god and i've and i gave you a condensed version of what people mean by god particularly when used as a proper noun So again, my answer to your question is God equals one and only maximally great being who is revealed in scripture. Right. Uh, It's that's very clear that that is that's how you define that word. Exactly. Right. He responds. The question was very simple and direct. (laughs) I I asked for the mean. Well, I guess it means meaning of the word God and the definition of the word it transliterates from. Your quote, etymology alone with respect to a word's origin isn't the sole determinant of a word of a word's meaning, and God equals one and only maximally great being. You absolutely know what etymology means, and based on your response, you know what the added definition to the God got means. Yeah, I I don't even know what he was getting at at that point. I mean, like, yeah, yes, I I know what etymology means, right? (laughs) Yeah, because I wouldn't have said what I said previously if I didn't and the other the other part too is like I'm starting to pick up on as as a, as this conversation is unfolding you know th- this word transliterates like he, he keeps using that word transliterate and it was at this point I was like you know what I'm not really sure if he really understands what transliterate means like translate mm-hmm. is one thing 
right. you know, transliterate is is slightly different. It's, it's a little something else. You know, right. and I wasn't really sure about that. So um, he goes and shows us the the etymology. He goes through the different, you know, supreme be- being, deity, pushing God from the Proto-Germanic, uh, the Old Church, Slavonic, Sanskrit. You know, we go through the, the history of the word. Right. And nevertheless, let's try this again. <laughs> what is the meaning of Elohim Allah Give the accurate definition and not a generic one. It doesn't mean the same as Yahweh. Now, this is the first time he introduces these other terms now. Right. Right. Because he went with got, which I think is dramatic, and now he's going into the Hebrew with, with Elohim. Right. So and actually, I think there's a subtle lesson here for um for apologists and anybody who's getting get into evangelism or apologetics, like you know, it's 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 good to come into these conversations with like a framework or um kind of just maybe a, a, a script in a sense, but you know, we also need to be students of the scriptures, you know, and we need to just kind of apply ourselves to studies so that sometimes conversations go in a direction that won't follow your script. You know what I'm saying like he clearly had a script in mind, like he was right. expecting me to give some definition akin to, you know, what, what he's got uh, listed here. Right. And then he had another move that he was going to make, you know, but because I didn't give the definition that he wanted me to give that fit within his, his, you know, uh, Hebrew, apo- Hebrew is like apologetic script. Right. It threw him off. Right. And so we've got to be, we've got to be thoughtful about that. Like, what does it mean to be nimble in a conversation? And what helps with that is if we're consistently loving God with our minds and attending to the scriptures, right? And you know, continuing to expose ourselves to in, in study to to His truth you know, in whatever field that we that we uh, find ourselves studying. And at this point, Adam's question has now vaporized into the ether, <laughs> and I don't <laughs> right. think it's ever going to be visited in this thread again. Yeah, I don't think so. so. Yeah. So let's continue. Um, and you know, here's the the definition that I, I gave. You know, etymology is the study of the origin of words, and the way in which their meanings have changed throughout history. The decline of etymology as a linguistic discipline. So, right again, it's the history of how a word is being used, and the reason why that's important, mm-hmm. uh, especially when we're reading the Bible. You know. We have to go by the terminology that the original author uses, right? We can't smuggle in our understanding of a particular term. We have to right. go by how they define the words and terms in scripture, right? Thanks. Because like, for instance, like the word nice, right? There was a time when the word nice actually meant not being nice, that you're stupid, <laughs> Yeah, you know, but now yeah. it, doesn't have that same connotation because the, the, the meaning of the word changed throughout time. Right. Right. So and that's just, that's just how language works, you know, mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. sure. So Adam responds. Yes, I know what etymology means. I also know, as I stated above, the origins of a word are not the sole determinant for the meaning of a word. You have to take into account context and semantic range. Just because I didn't reply with the definition you were anticipating doesn't mean I'm giving you a generic definition. I've provided a condensed definition of what I mean when I use the word God. And my definition corresponds with how the term has held meaning over time. Again, the origin of a word doesn't necessarily constrain or fix the meaning of that word. To say that Yahweh is the maximally great being is in no way out of step with using the term Elohim. Honestly, I'm not even sure what point you're trying to make. Can you clarify what you're getting at? This is the second question Adam proposes to um, the good doctor. Right, right. So, so to Adam's point, right, does scripture coincide with Mr. Coleman's definition of Yahweh? being a great being. Well, Mm -hmm. in Psalm 145 in verse three, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. Right. Uh, In Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, Mm -hmm. Lord, your God, God is of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty and the awesome God 
who is not partial and takes no bribe. Uh, First Chronicles 29, verse 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Right. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Right? The Bible's right. very clear. Even though it's not being said the way Adam said, right? But it's you see it throughout scripture that he is the most maximum greatest being. That's it. Right. right? And, and, and there's some... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Psalm 95 verse 3. For the Lord is a what? A great God and a great king above all gods. And yeah, that's... that's I'm done. So yeah. No, I mean, and so you have philosophers, you know, who have a way of articulating, you know, what the Bible says there, you know, that the, the Bible talks about how God is great and the term maximally great being in circles of philosophy is just one way that they articulate what's, what's being voiced in all those scriptures that you just read. It, it, now, I don't, I don't know if he realizes this, but if you, uh, when you ask a question like define God, right. If I was going to give a full answer, right. Then, then it was, then you're going to have to talk talking about, the different things that are, that are only attributable to God, like, you know, his, right. his omni, om, omnipotence. And what right. does that mean? His omniscience. And what does that mean? Omnipresence. And what does that mean? You got to start kind of laying right. out the whole ontology, the, the whole the, ontology. Thank you. Yes. Exactly. You know, and so rather than saying, you know, going through all of those things, it's just, it's kind of in shorthand, if you will, to say he's the maximally great being, like there's no being that could be greater than right. this being, because right. if there was, then that being would be God. Right. Exactly. The, the most, the most high God, the most high God. Nobody right. can be. There can't be more than one most high, right? Right. It's, it's like saying so and so is the goat. You know what I mean? Like you know, greatest of all time. Like there can't be more than one folks who are the greatest of all time. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. Right. So back to the the thread. Uh, Adam says, Elohim, supreme one, mighty one, etc. Isn't at all contradictory to the definition I provided above. So I'm not sure what you're aiming at. Right. Uh, and Adam continues, not trying to nitpick, but I just noticed it seems like you've edited some of your comments. I'm not accusing you of being dishonest, but just want to clarify that I've been answering your questions as you originally posted them. For example, in your initial response to my first comment, you only asked me to properly define God. I don't believe the other portion of your question about etymology and transliteration was in your original response. Again, not accusing you of dishonesty, just clarifying for anyone reading this thread. Right, right. And I hate to say it, to be honest, but, you know, I, I've like this is my first rodeo ha having these kind of conversations on, on, on the Internet. And sometimes people do that. You know, they'll ask a question and then maybe, you know, after they ask it, they think of a, a more pointed way to ask the question. And so then they go edit it. And if you don't respond to the edited version, then they'd be like, oh, yeah, so you didn't answer all of my questions. You see right. what I'm saying? Like some right. people do that with the intention of giving onlookers the impression that you're not engaging all the questions. So I, I was trying not to accuse them of that. But it's like, OK, well, just in case, <laughs> right? just in case somebody is reading along, because I'm always conscious of the onlookers. Um, yeah, I was like, let me let me just kind of throw this caveat in there. Sure, you know I mean? sure. Yeah. And it's sad that that has to be the case, but you know, it just is what it is. And the good doctor responds, wow, you post a chart of the so-called Trinity. But when I ask you for a definitive definition of Elohim, Allahim, which are Hebrew word, you still cannot give me an actual definition. God is the English suppose, supposed translation and Theos is the Greek supposed transliteration of the Hebrew word Allahim, Elohim. And yet you are not understanding the point. Clarity. Theos means a deity with the article whole refers to the supreme divinity, magistrate, council. Allahayim Elohim means deities, gods, the supreme God, occasionally applied to the magistrate, council, angels, judges. My question and the answer is pretty simple. Your chart is a reflection of a flawed doctrine. You post an image of a council called the unbiblical trinity with god in the center expressing a council consisting of god the father god the son and god the holy spirit but the chart is missing the full council in which christ gave clarity 
use to explain himself. So this is the, right. I guess, the punchline. This is the mic drop it, moment. Right. And it, it took us like, I don't know how long to, just to get to this <laughs> to this point here. Like, what was he trying to get to? And at the end of the day, after all, after we've gone through what, what does God or God mean and, you know, Elohim, so on and so forth, what we find ourselves with is a straw man. That's what we find ourselves with. A straw man. Why? Because, you know, as we posted earlier, that uh, that depiction of the, you know, the triangle figure, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, that's not depicting a council. Right. It's not. It's not. It's not depicting a council. And that already made that clear. Right. There, there's one God existing as three persons. You know, Unus. I'm sorry. Not, I shouldn't say I made it clear, but that's that's the doctrine of the Trinity. Right. Una substantia tre persona. There's one substance. There's one God. One one God being existing as three persons, right? We're not talking about a council as in like a collection of you know mm-hmm. heavenly dudes hanging out, you know what I mean? You know, doing stuff. That's not that's not what we're talking about. There's one God, one being existing as three persons. So when he says, "Oh yeah, it's a council," he's he's now reinterpreting the image. Which, by the way, I've I've never heard anybody you know um, you know look at that image and interpret it as being a council. So you know maybe that's just on me. I, I've never seen anybody look at it that way. But that that aside. Mm-hmm. It's a you know he treats it as a council, and then he smuggles in the rest of his argument based upon that straw man right. uh, uh, understanding of, of what that image represents. Uh, another uh, apologetic point pointer for those who are having these kind of engagements: uh, we have to be really careful how we use lexicons, right? Sure. Because you know he says here "theos" means, and he gives uh, several definitions for the term. Just because you have a list of definitions, you don't get to plug in the one you like. That's good. Yeah. You know, the sentence, the paragraph, that defines which definition you use. And also, you, you got to think about, right, etymology. Uh, this word, what does this word or term mean during the Bronze Age? Mm. If you're reading a Bronze Age text or an mm-hmm. Iron Age, does this this mean the same in Hebraic culture as it does in Kemetic culture? Like That's these are questions point. you have to ask yourself in, in order to not miss understand what the author is trying to relay. That's good. That's good. So that's a great point. All right. So <clears throat> and he quotes John 10, 34 to 36. Jesus answered them, It is not written in your law. I said, Ye are gods. Oh, ye are gods. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the father had sanctified and sent into the world. Thou blasphemous, because I said I am the son of God. Question, who are the ye of gods referring to? Clarity. There's no contradiction in my comments. When I posted Yahweh, doesn't mean Allah Elohim. Yah means he. And it's the short form of Hawa Hava means to exist. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I don't even recall it. Like, uh, I don't recall saying that he did contradict. I, I'm not even sure where he, where he got that from, you know. But again, you know, I think sometimes it, it's, it's, we have to be sensitive to it. Sometimes people aren't responding to you. They're responding to maybe some other argument that they had. You know what I mean? And so they just, you just happen to come along. Well, it's to, to it, your point, it's the script. It's the script. Right? He already has an argument and a defeater already in there. And he just wants you to come along for the ride. Right. And you haven't exactly. been a compliant passenger in his argument. <laughs> right. right. That's, that's the right. problem here. That's the problem. Yeah. All right. So Adam responds. There is a difference between not giving you a definition and not giving you the definition you were prepared to respond to. By the way, there's also a difference between translation and transliteration. Translation is to take a word from language A and communicate the meaning of that word by using a comparable word from language B. Transliteration gets into resolving an issue that arises when language B doesn't have an equivalent i.e. alphabetical or phonetic, to a word in language A. And therefore, a modification is needed to the word across languages to maintain meaning. Right. Right. Right? Communicate the meaning of that word by using a comparable word from language B. 
transliteration gets oh i think we said it already uh yeah now as for the last response you're conflating distinct concepts and making the straw man argument the image i posted is not depicting a council the image is to communicate the idea of god being una substantia thres persona god is one substance una substantia existing as three persons thres persona father son holy spirit again this image is not depicting a council, if by that you mean a conglomerate of distinct beings. Right. And so now I'm, I'm being even more specific. I'm giving them right. a basic definition of the Trinity in terms mm -hmm. of what it is that we're claiming to be the case. And I'm still throwing ifs in there. I'm still trying to keep it, you know, keep it light a little bit. You know, I'm trying not to put on him, you know, what it seems like he's, he's even saying. I'm trying to soften it a bit by saying if by that you mean a conglomerate of distinct beings. But as we go on to see, that's that's exactly what he meant. Right. Uh, also, John 10, 34, 36 won't help your argument. There are divergent views on that passage. For example, some will argue that it points to human judges slash leaders that were under God's judgment. Others will argue that this is a reference to a divine council, meaning supernatural slash non-physical beings who would hold various jurisdictions of authority, i.e. regions of earth, and yet are lower in authority to Yahweh. In either case, whichever way you go, with that interpretation, John 10 can't be leveraged to undermine Trinitarianism. Two simple facts help us to see why John 10 can't accomplish that. One, throughout the scriptures, there are activities and attributes that are exclusively attributed to Yahweh as indicative of his divine essence and status and most high. These would include things like external externality, omniscience. I meant to say eternality on that one. That was, that was okay. different. Yeah, type of omniscience. Uh, omnipotence, receiving worship, being the creator, and so on. Activities and attributes like these are made in relation to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yet, as I'm sure you would agree, the scriptures declare there's only one God. Trinitarianism resolves that seemingly apparent tension by affirming there is one God existing as three persons. Yeah. All right. As clear as I can make it, right. Yeah. Two. The Trinitarian view is reinforced by the fact that repeatedly throughout the New Testament, Old Testament passages that are explicit, explicitly about Yahweh are applied to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, respectively. To use a philosophical term, the New Testament authors use Old Testament texts to make an identity relation between Yahweh and Jesus, as well as Yahweh and the Holy Spirit. This is a brief summary, but the point is whether John 10 refers to human judges or supernatural counsel, in either case, the passage does not overturn, much less undermine the biblical data for the Trinity. I briefly outlined. In other words, John 10 leaves the evidence for the Trinity untouched, so you would need to look elsewhere to try to make your case. Also, remember, what happened to Adam's original question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gone. It's out the Never window. returning. Right, right. Right, so... <clears throat> Mr. Richardson replies, laugh out loud. I completely understand the difference between translation, transliterations, paraphrase, and versions. Mm. You posted all of that and said absolutely nothing. <laughs> Christ used Psalm 82 to justify himself as well as the judges in which it cannot be undone. This is why you were tap dancing around the question because what you posted is absolutely nonsense. Question. Where are the judges of Israel in your floor chart? Psalm 82, verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Right. Again, you made a lengthy post and post absolutely and, and post absolutely nothing except the doctrine of syncretism <laughs> of a second century concept. Right. It's interesting you use the, the Greek una as part of your justification for the unbiblical trinity. You do know about Uni, which is the Etruscans triple goddesses, which is also known as the Capitoline Triad or the triple witches in which the concept of the Trinity comes from and introduced by the once pagan worshiper Tertullian through what's called, again, syncretism. Nevertheless, Christ made it clear that disciples will be judges who will help judge Israel, confirming Psalm 82. That is excluded from the diagram you posted 
which further knocked down your chart. So, wow. what the good doctor is saying to you, Adam, is that <laughs> we don't believe you. We need to see more people. <laughs> more people. <laughs> right, right. Right? Not enough folks in that council, apparently. So, right. the Trinity, in a, in a weird way, it's not that he disagrees with the idea of there being a council, even though that's not what Trinity is. His right. issue is the Trinity is not expansive enough to be biblical. Right, right. Because right? it's not enough for there to be the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You also need th these judges to be part of what he would call the council slash Trinity. And I, what I this is what I would call the, the he's he's applying the Oprah hermeneutic. You know what I'm saying? The Oprah hermeneutic. So it's like you get to be in the council and you get to be in the council. You get to be the council. Like it's like everybody's in the council. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so as, as you get to see here in a second, it gets to leave a little more squirrely. It's crazy as that was, but yeah. Luke 22, 29, 30. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father have appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Also, Part of that council are the angels who are called the sons of <laughs> that's God. A, that's a, you get to be at the council. So Everybody's in the council, bro. It's the judges and right. the angels alongside right. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? So right. Uh, Adam replies, not sure what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I posted a response to your last comment about an hour ago. But it's not showing up on this thread anymore. The gist of the comment was that your last response seems to indicate you aren't picking up on my previous points. One, the image I posted is not about a council. Also, it's not about Israel or judges of Israel. The image I posted is about the triune God of Israel. Two, again, it doesn't matter how someone interprets John 10, whether it be pertaining to human judges or supernatural council, in either case, the biblical data I alluded to that demonstrates the deity and by inference, unity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is in no way undermined. All right? Thanks, yeah. That's when I started kind of suspecting. It's like, eh, this may not go so well. You know what I mean? It's, it's right. a little sketchy. Right. A little and, sketchy. And Adam continues. Uh, I would also add that your point about Uni and Tertullian isn't really well thought out. Tertullian then introduced the concept of the Trinity. He's credited as being the first person to use that term in arguments along those lines to describe and explain what the biblical authors taught. Tertullian then <clears throat> create the Trinity. He used what he had at his disposal to articulate the truth of Trinitarianism, tr Trinitarianism right. <clears throat> to the people of his time and cultural context. In order to, substan to substantiate your claim about secretism on his part, you would have to clearly demonstrate what specific beliefs he added to scripture that wasn't already taught by the biblical authors. Interesting enough, if anyone would be against secretism, it would be Tertullian. <coughs> One of his more famous sayings is, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Which was a question he posed to drive home the point that Anytime someone imports ideas into Christian teaching that the scriptures don't support, then you end up with heresy. It's extremely unlikely that a guy who wrote works with the central premise being not to import ideas that are foreign to scripture would turn around and do just that. Right. Right. And so here's, here's the thing. I want to make a real quick point um, because this is just like another, I think, apologetics tip, particularly when you're dealing with people who have um, objections to the Trinity a lot of times uh, you you run into people who say that the Trinity was like a later invention by some of the early church fathers, that you had um, some of the, the Latin and Greek you know, uh, so-called fathers of the church or you know doctors of the church or whatever it may be, basically theologians, you know, of the second, third, fourth century who took Greek and Latin categories and then read it into the Jewish text, creating this doctrine of the Trinity. And so, you know, or they might say something like, um, you know, the doctrine of the Trinity has changed so many times or over time. And so, you know, you want to be able to be on the lookout for objections like that. And one simple way to respond to it is um, 
ultimately it's the scriptures. It's the authors of the biblical text uh, conveying what God has progressively revealed over the course of Genesis to Revelation, uh, what God has progressively revealed about himself, right? Um, God has in, in the scriptures revealed that he is indeed uh, one God existing as three persons. And what you do see in church history over time is that people are taking concepts that are uh, from their context and from their time to articulate, explain, and teach what the Bible said about God being uh, Trinitarian, right. right? So it's not this development, if you will, of um, uh, over time kind of rehashing and development of Trinitarian doctrine. What you're seeing throughout church history is people wrestling with how to best articulate what it is right. that the scripture said, right? right. And so I think that's that's one thing we definitely be on the lookout. I, I, just is real quick, I'm not sure if I have this in the later slide, but just to kind of give an example, um, John uh, chapter 10, verses 33, uh, we were just reading John 10 a second ago. And um, after Jesus makes this claim about being the son of God, when you think about the response, the, the immediate audience, the Israelites uh, that were present at the time, they took up stones to stone him. And then he's like, yo, what you going to stone me for? And they say, it is not for... Uh, a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Right mm -hmm. now, think about that. Coupled with the fact that he had just said that he was the son of God. Now, in some ways, um, the term son of God wasn't all that like, you know, controversial, but evidently he must have said it in a particular way but to give the impression right. that he means something more than just, you know, being created by God or being an Israelite or something of that nature, because in their minds, by him saying that he was the son of God, he was in some sense saying that he was of the same, like made of the same stuff, right? right? And so he was making a divinity claim, essentially, you know, so because you can't be uh, the God type of stuff, if you will, if you're not God. There's only there's only one being right. who is made up of God stuff. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, it, right. it was kind of a crude way of putting it. And so they picked up on that. They was like, no, you, you wait a minute, you're saying, you're saying something more than you just, you know, like an Israelite or a son by covenant or something like that. You're saying that you're actually the son of God, which would then, you know, make you make you make you would have to be God in order to be the, uh, the son right. of God in that sense. That being said, this is where, you know, later on it makes to make sense of things like that. It makes sense to say that, you know, there's one substance, you know, una substantia, you know, one being, you know, um, existing as three persons, father, son, Holy Spirit. You know, we can say they're the same being, same substance. And yet identifying these these three persons uh I, I, it's really actually familiar. spicier than that with jesus right because again they approach him are you claiming to be god he references psalm 82 right he's like all right so remember what god did to those guys again whether you believe they're human judges or you know right. divine counsel right he condemns these guys right so what he's inferring is like well if i'm god remember what god did to these guys so you should watch your mouth. Who, who you talking to? <laughs> that's why they got tight with him, right? It, it was they weren't happy, too happy with that, right? That's why right, right after he said that, they wanted to kill this dude. He's like, oh, so you trying to? So not only are you saying you're the divine, you're God, that you could do, you know, you're gonna do to us, you're gonna condemn us, right? Very spicy. Very we were spicy. just talking to random people. We were talking to Pharisees and all that. He, he had right. smoke for everybody, right? Exactly. The leaders of Israel, yeah. So. Uh, the good doctor responds, come on, stop with the, the jargon. I stated that Tertullian introduced the concept in which the Romans, Etruscans, and other cultures had a so-called trinity. Who was the first to introduce the concept? We can go through the verbal gymnastics, who and when introduced the term and the unbiblical concept. The Israelites during the time of the Messiah used Elohim, Allahim, that includes the Father, Son, Spirit of Yah, Israel, judges and the angels again explain the following text i can introduce another argument to the flawed unbiblical concept but i'm not going to stay right here then we can deal with the co-equal and other arguments john 10 34 35 jesus answered them it is not written in your law i said ye are gods if he called them gods unto whom the word of god came and the scripture cannot be broken uh, yeah, and he goes into um, Psalm 82, 6. I said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So, yeah, so what I want to do, he brought up the, 
these uh Etruscan Etruscan oh, yeah, triad. Yeah. So this is from the American Journal of Philo- Philology, uh, and it's entitled "Was the Capitoline Triad Etruscan Etruscan or Italic?" Uh, and it says here the explanation of its character. The only positive hypothesis which have been offered is that of Wisolfa, who could account for the Romans' association of the two as Capitolium and Capitolium Vetus on the ground that the latter was a political triad, but composed of three native Roman deities, Jupiter, Mars, and Quirinius. That's not the Trinity. At all. <laughs> right. That is not the Trinity. A triad is not a Trinity. These are distinctive gods. That is not what Christians are trying to articulate when they talk about the Trinity. Right. It's not a triad. So I don't know why he brought that up. Also, this is from uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica. Tiena, principal is a Krushkin, deity, god of the thunderbolt, sky and storm. He was identified with the Greek god Zeus and the Roman god Jupiter. Tiena, together with his wife Uni, Identified with Greek Hera and Roman Juno and Minerva or Minerva, Roman Minerva, formed the supreme triad of the Excrucian pantheon. A trinity is not a pantheon, nor is it a triad at all. Yeah, it's two distinct things. Right. The triad heresy or triathism is the belief that the Father, Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are three distinct gods. Better than one God with three persons. Right. So it can't come from there when it completely goes against that. Right. The Trinity can't come from a triad when it's different than a triad. Right. Right. Uh, so, again, he, he likes to use Psalm 82. So let's let's look more in context of the psalm. It says here, God has taken his place in a divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. And fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth. You shall inherit all the nations. Now, Mm -hmm. when you read the whole psalm, his definition of this council becomes very problematic. Mm Because now what you're saying is, because you said that this this council, right, it has the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, but also has these judges. Right. And you quote Psalm 82. But the issue here is these judges are being condemned. (laughs) <laughs> right. So within this this council, you don't want to be, yeah. condemned judges. Right. That's not a good look at all. So yeah, everybody and their grandma that he included in the in the, the council. These aren't the judges that you want to be associating with. The ones of court here in eight, uh, Psalm 82 right. for sure. These are not the guys who are, are even going to judge Israel. They're being judged. Right. That's They're right. being judged. Right. So how can they be part of the council? They're getting Obvious. kicked out of this council. <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting the boot, right? Yeah. Um, and of course, he makes mention of the term Elohim. Mm-hmm. Uh, several different entities are referred to as Elohim in the Old Testament. Considering this variety provides insight as to how the term should be understood. The Hebrew text of the Old Testament refers to the following as Elohim. Yahweh, the God of Israel. The members of Yahweh heavily counsel, the God of foreign nations, demons, spirits of the human dead, and angels. Mm. So if we're going to use the overarching definition of Elohim and not use the term specifically how the verses use them, part of your counsel is demons and spirits of the human dead. Everybody in that jank. Like, for instance, <laughs> First Kings 11, verse 33, because they have fors- forsaken me and worship Astaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chermash, the god of Moab, 
mm-hmm. and Milcom, the God of the Ammonites, they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight and keeping my statutes and my rules as David's father did. The word God here translated in Hebrew is Elohim. Mm. So part of the council is Astaroth, the goddess of the Sidonians. <laughs> right. Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, that's part of the council? You see how pro- problematic it is? Yeah, I think they got Pikachu in there too, man. They got, they got, Pikachu. <laughs> they got Optimus Prime. They got... <laughs> expect the gadgets. Expect... <laughs> you know, everybody, yeah. everybody. Oh, so man. this bonus. already demonstrates that the word should not be identified with one particular set of attributes. Elohim is not a synonym for God. Mm. All beings called Elohim in the Hebrew Bible share a certain characteristic. They all inhabit the non-human realm. Right. By nature, Elohim is not part of the world of humankind, the world of ordinary embodiment. Elohim, as a term, indicates residence, not a set of attributes. Mm. It identifies the proper domain of the entity it describes. Yahweh, the lesser gods of his council, angels, demons and the disembodied dead all inhabit the spiritual world they may cross over into the human world as the bible informs us and certain humans may be transported to the non-human realm like prophets you know like enoch but the proper domain of each of the two separate and distinct places so yahweh by that definition is an elohim but right. no elohim is like yahweh there you go yep there it is. So, which you just back to this flawed diagram, Adam. <laughs> this flat, yeah, right. Yeah. So I want to pick up on that, man. There's a few more things I want to say uh, before we get out of here. I mean, you, you just masterfully, you know, broke that down, you know, because he was throwing that word Elohim around, and I really don't know if if he'd done the study on it that that he thought he had, you know. And I'm not trying to disrespect the brother, you know what I mean? Right. But it, it comes back to bite you, you know, the way that he was throwing it around. So I just want to add a, a few more things. You know, I said earlier in this exchange with him, um, those couple points as to why we affirm the Trinity, right? Um, it's not something that's like a later, you know, Christian invention. It arises from the scriptures. Right. Um, and in particular, um, you know, God did something very special in the first century, right? The resurrection of Jesus was a game changer, Right. There's, there's, you know, there was a, a miracle upon miracles, above all miracles, if you will, at least uh, uh, in terms of human history, that shook everything up and caused those first century, you know, Jews who followed after Christ to have to reevaluate their theology, mm-hmm. you know, and, and to and to understand better what it is that God was conveying, particularly about His own self, right? And so, um, you know, let me let me just say this: like, I, I think this is um. Kind of like one way I like to put it. Imagine if you're driving in a car, right? Um, and you have a windshield, but you don't have any, um, you know, re- you know, rear view mirrors. You know, whether it be on the sides or in the back, right? You can see great going forward, but you're gonna have some problems. You know, when you need to look back and you know, shoulder check and all that kind of stuff, and do lane changes and all that sort of thing, right? It's helpful to have the windshield to look through, but you also need those those mirrors, right? So, in a sense. Um, look, being able to look through the windshield, that's kind of like the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament is in many ways forward looking. OK, it, you know, there are certain things in the New Testament that you can't understand unless you have a proper understanding of the Old Testament. Right. But then the New Testament is like those rear view mirrors. Right. Because there are certain things in the Old Testament that you can't properly see and understand unless you check the New Testament. Right. And so there's this two way, this, this two directional um, approach that we, that we need to take in understanding the scriptures. Mm. Again, there's certain things that, that the, uh, the Old Testament lays the groundwork for and helps to understand old, uh, the New Testament and then vice versa. In so much as, as Christ was risen from the dead and you have God revealing certain things about himself and his work in the New Testament, it then clarifies and brings to light certain things that were you know, present in the in the, uh, the Old Testament as well. All right. And I would, you know, uh, among those things, I would say that the Trinity is right there with it. So let me just uh, present uh, real quick. I'm going to do my best um, Alfredo uh, impersonation. All right. Here we go. Uh, So 
the Trinity. You know, this guy is kind of picking up where you left off. When we say uh -huh. Trinity, and I'll, I'll breeze through this pretty quickly. I mean, it's, we're coming up on an hour. Um, there's one God existing as three persons, okay? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Una Substantia, um, Trey Persona. Um, oh, by the way, you know, when I said Una Substantia, I thought that was interesting. That seemed to have been a trigger word for him because that's when he launched into the whole Unai thing. Right. And, and that's a, just another one of those um, kind of voc vocabulary fallacies, you know, <laughs> type of a deal where it's like, you know, uh, you say one word that sounds like another word and you just, you know, of necessity associate them together. You know, Una's, well, Una. Well, it's not just that. It's, it's he's thinking Greek. Therefore, it's it's militating against Hebrew. Right. So that's the issue as well. It's like, you know. And I think he did say something about the Greek, which was interesting because mm -hmm. um, Tertullian is referred to as one of the Latin fathers because he's, um, among, among other things, most noted for being one of the uh, initial uh, theologians in the church to mm -hmm. write his works in Latin. So mm -hmm. it's actually, you know, it wasn't even Greek anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's an aside. But anyway, you know, the Trinity is one guy existing as three persons. Um, as I said, uh, this is just kind of like a quick, you know, rough draft I pulled off. Um, you know, uh, you know, Google just kind of give people an understanding of what it is that I mean. You have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that throughout the scriptures are giving or are um, uh, referred to as having these different attributes of being eternal. You know, like, you know, the Holy Spirit is referred to as like the eternal spirit in Hebrews uh, 9, 14. Right. Um, you have Jesus where he has that whole dialogue. Where you know he's talking about the you know Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and they're like, "Yo, right. you're not even fifty years old." He's like, "You know, before Abraham was, I mm -hmm. am." You know, so he's speaking to that pre-existence. John one one, uh, again referring to the logos that pre-existent, and of course the Father Eternal, and then you can just kind of work your way through uh, omnipresent, omnipotent, um, omniscient, and I actually I added at the bottom there um, creator and life getter, giver, etc. You know, there are scriptures um, that are referring to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, specifically in each case, being uh, taking part in creation, right? I'm thinking about like Hebrews chapter, uh, you know, one verses one through four in, in the case of Christ. Obviously, Genesis one and two, where you have this, the spirit brooding upon the waters. You know, if, if in Hebrew psychology, if you're reading a text and you see this entity that's credited with something like creation, you, it's helping you to classify what kind of entity that is. Right. That's not just your run of the mill Elohim deity, some angel right. running around right. doing stuff like that's that's high language right there. That's that's an indicator of the kind of divinity that only the most high would have. You know, So that's when you see creator and life giver. Those are the kind of things that you're um, as, as a Hebrew reader of the scriptures. That's what you're going to be seeing if you're like a first century Jew, Jew reading the New Testament and looking back into the old. So anyway, um, real quick. So you have these different passages that assign these attributes that are only um, rightly attributable to the most high, omniscient, omnipresent creator and so forth. But then at the same time, um, if you look through the new Testament, there's what we can refer to as I thou passages, you know, um, that you have the different uh, figures, your father, son, Holy spirit, each of them seeing themselves as a self and interacting with one another as like another self of some sort. As a distinct self, a distinct person, you know. So there's this I and you relationship between the Father and the Son. There's this mm -hmm. I and you relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit and the Father, and so on and so forth. This is what you're seeing right throughout the Old Testament. I mean, excuse me, throughout the uh, the New Testament, and in other passages that we'll see. I'll just breeze real, through real quick, just so people can kind of get a taste of it. Um, so for example, this, this is an easy one. You know, Jesus during the incarnation. You know, clearly Jesus is praying all the time. <laughs> right that, that's that's an i thou relationship he's you have jesus praying to the father right he's not praying to himself he's not kind of looking inward and praying or something like that he's clearly praying to the father um and we can see that in particular um uh, with the prayers that he prayed as he was on the cross right father forgive them for they know not what they do right so he's clearly talking to the father now what's interesting is that uh, when it comes to forgiveness this is in Luke uh, 23, 34. Earlier in the book, you have this passage where the guy, um, excuse me, earlier in, in the Gospels, you have this, this passage where the guy's being lowered through the ceiling. And then Jesus says, you know, Lord, you know, uh, be forgiven of your sins. And then people are questioning, like, yo, how can you do that? And he's like, yo, I got power to forgive sins on earth. So Jesus had power to forgive sins. And yet here on the cross, he asked the Father to forgive their sins, right? 
Now, he didn't have to do that. I mean, I guess he, you know, he had power on earth to do so, but nevertheless, he has a father that's indicated that there's this ideal relationship. He wasn't mm-hmm. just praying to himself because he would have just been like, all right, cool, y'all, y'all are forgiven. It's a wrap. Right. You know, it's an ideal relationship. Likewise, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? It's an ideal relationship. There's a you and there's a me between the father and the son. You know, um, in the, the Garden of Gethsemane, again, I'm just kind of breezing through. Uh, Father, if you're not willing, take this cup from me. Excuse me, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Um, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Right. So there again, there's that I that relationship. There's a there's a my will, and there's a your will. Right. Now, what's interesting is that to, the capacity to have a will, to have you know the ability to be to have some agency, you know, to, to desire to do things. Right. That capacity to have a will, that's a feature of personhood. Right. You know, th- this cell phone doesn't have a will. You know, this microphone I'm speaking to doesn't have a will. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Wills are, are something that's indicative of personhood, right? Um, let me see. All right. You know, real quick, you know, as far as uh, post-resurrection, right? Um, particularly like in, in Revelation, people can just kind of read these passages here where it talks about, you know, the, the different thrones depicted in Revelation. There's, there's a my throne and there's a his throne. Right. You see, you know, the the risen Christ interacting with the father as in the form of the lamb taking the scrolls. You know, so there's there's this interaction between those two figures. There's an exchange from one to another. Right. And maybe most importantly, you know, for I'm engaged (laughs) in another one of those scuffles that you mentioned earlier online. I'm engaged with in in one with the gentleman. Um, I'm not going to call him out just just out of respect. Um, But before the incarnation. Before the incarnation, there's this I thou relationship and interaction between the father and the son. We can see that clearly in John 17, where you know, it says, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence uh, with the glory that I had with you hmm. before the world began. He didn't say the glory that I had as you. He said the glory that I had with you. Right. So there's an I thou relationship there. And even further, it says, Father, I, I want those who have given me. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, Father. I want those who you have given me to be with me where I am, and to set um, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Right? You love me before the creation of the world. Okay. So this pre-incarnate Christ before creation, right? There was a love relationship. There's this I thou love relationship between the Father and the Son. And so the fact that you have this I thou relationship is an indicator, right? Again, we already talked about how to, to the capacity to have a will is an indicator of personhood. Also, relationality, the capacity to relate to others, that's another indicator of personhood, right? So you have persons interacting with one another, in this case, uh, Jesus and the Father, before creation. So it's not just the incarnation. Before the incarnation, you have this I thou relationship and the interaction between the two. Lastly, the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, this is very interesting. It says in John 15, uh, verse 26, but when the, the comforter has come, this is Jesus speaking, but when the comforter has come, whom I will send to you from the father. So yeah, we got Jesus identified, the Holy Spirit identified, the father and, and the father identified. Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit. Um, said, so I will send unto you from the father, even the spirit of truth, which proceeds, um, from the father, he shall testify of me, right? And so it talks about how it also further that there's he's not going to speak anything that he doesn't receive from the father. Right. So now you have the Holy Spirit who is clearly different than Jesus and different from the father. He's being sent by, um, you know, uh, Jesus from the father. So there's an I thou relationship there between them of, of the father and the son and then the one who's being sent the Holy Spirit. But in addition, to that it's an indicator that the Holy Spirit has some sort of conscious uh, cognitive faculties because you can't give you can't receive and then convey information unless you're able to process that information in fact the holy spirit right. speaks in the new testament mm-hmm. right he speaks uh said to philip when he went to go talk to the ethiopian eunuch it's the holy spirit talking right the holy spirit he speaks he teaches right uh the, the bible also says that he has a will because it says that, he, that the holy spirit gives he distributes gifts to the church as he wills, mm. right? So the Holy Spirit has a will. 
It also says that he searches, uh, yea, even the deep things of God. So he's got cognitive faculties. He's in this is a uh, uh, speaks of omniscience there, even right. So he's speaking, teaching, he has cognitive faculties, he's got a will. These are all features, you know, the ability to communicate. That's a feature of cognition. You know I'm saying of, of, um, of personhood, I should say, right? All right, and I haven't said all that. You know, I, I want to kind of wrap it up. Um, I'm, I'm kind of teasing this argument out. I just, I've been just kind of tinkering, tinkering with this a little bit. But so we see that we have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've got reason to believe that these are all uh, distinct persons. We're not saying that they're independent persons. We're not saying that they're separate persons, but they're persons. Uh, they're all, there's one God, three persons, right? Father, uh, Son, Holy Spirit. Each of them, again, is credited with some role in creation. You know, obviously the father in Genesis 1 1, this, this is obviously as, as it can be. The son, um, you know, it, we're referring to the logos in John 1 1, you know, and also Hebrews uh, chapter 1 through 4 it talks about how um, nothing was made that, was, that wasn't made through him, right? The father made all things through him. The Holy Spirit obviously is hovering uh, over creation in Genesis uh, 1 1 and 2. So they're all taking part of creation. So, the, so they're all, um, you can accurately say they're the cause of the universe. Right. They're all attributed um, the activity of being the cause of the universe. So I'm, I'm calling this the um, this is super experimental. Y'all, I'm just going to throw it out here just for the fun of it. I'm calling this the Kalamian Trinity argument, <laughs> the Kalamian Trinity. That people are familiar you know, who've watched this channel. I'm a fan of the Kalam cosmological argument. Um, and I've said it on here before, but just for the sake of, uh, of clarity, um, typically with cosmological arguments for God's existence, uh, they come in two phases. Right. The first phase um, is an argument that identifies some sort of foundation, first principle or cause of the universe, a cause of all reality. That's usually the first phase. OK. And then the second phase is like an analysis of what that cause must be like. So typically with cosmological arguments, when you really hash them out, they're going to have those two phases. OK. Um, now, when it comes to Kalam, most people are most familiar with the first phase where it says, you know, very simply, I'm just kind of breezing through. Um, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. OK, that's a Kalam cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, when, you, when we think about that word universe, um, what we mean by that is all time, space, matter and energy. That's what people mean when they say the universe. OK. Um, so if the universe had a cause and by universe, we mean time, space, matter and energy, then that would mean that the uh, the cause of the universe would have to be timeless, spaceless, immaterial and enormously powerful. Right. I'm going to emphasize the timeless part, which I misspelled twice in this slide right here for whatever reason. But <laughs> I just created it right before we, we hopped on this live I mean, on, on this uh, recording here. But anyway, um, if time had a beginning. Right. Because we're talking about the universe created time, space, matter, energy. That means time had a beginning. If time had a beginning, then that means that the cause of the universe can't be in time. It would have to be timeless in some sense or another. OK, so now we're going to keep that in mind. So. With that being the case, we can add this other argument. OK, the cause of the universe is timeless and therefore past eternal. You can't, you can't be timeless unless you're eternal in the past. Right. You had no beginning. The cause of the universe is timeless and therefore past eternal. Premise two, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit cause the universe. Therefore, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are timeless and are therefore past eternal. Right? So if I were to read all those six steps real quickly, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Premise one. Premise two, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the, the universe has a cause. The cause of the universe is timeless and therefore past eternal. That's the step, step one of the next argument. Uh, premise two of the second argument, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit cause the universe. And then the conclusion is therefore the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are timeless and therefore past eternal, right? So here's the thing. If um, if the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are the cause of the universe and you're know, following our argument here, they have to be timeless, then you have these three persons Father, Son, Holy Spirit that are all past eternal, right? They're past eternal entities who cause the universe and have all these other attributes. How can that be if there's only one God? The way to resolve that tension is exactly how, um, we're, how we come back to the Trinity. The way that you can have 
past eternal entities, if you will, past eternal persons, I should say, cells, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who are causes of the universe, the way that you can have all three of them past eternal and yet not have a, a conflict with the notion of there being one God is if they are one God. If the Trinity is true, hmm. there is one God existing as three persons, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So that's that's my Kalamian Trinity argument. I'm kind of floating out there. Yeah, I, I, I like just came it. up. Yeah, I like it. You like it? Yeah. Cool, cool. Just had to get a little nerdy there. You know what I mean for for the philosophy no, heads, no, man. You know how we do. You know how we do. And so you know, um, yeah, man. I, I think that when it comes to um, you know the, the notion of the Trinity. I mean, there's a wealth of arguments for it. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of different directions we can go. I think I think the best ones, you know, flow straight from straight from scripture. You know, we simply report what it is that the scriptures have to say about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right. And I think the best explanation of what it, the, the scriptures say about the Father, Son, Holy Spirit would be that, you know, God is revealing himself as as Trinitarian. You know, I think if you, you veer from that one way or the other, you run into some real problems, you know. Yep. So, um Kelly Richardson, you know, much love to you, my brother. You know, now it was, it was, here's the thing. Um, having gone through all that, the, the brother blocked me, like mid-conversation. <laughs> That's one thing that we didn't mention. He, he, he straight blocked me. And I don't know if you had that slide where, where you put up later about Tertullian. I don't even know if it's necessary to show it. But, um, you know, as, as I'm being soft and asking questions and, you know, um, just kind of like keeping it light, um, rather than actually engaging what it is that I've said, the dude blocks me and then proceeds to talk trash <laughs> in, in like another in another post. And, you know, I, I thought that he blocked me. I was like, man, maybe I'm tripping. But, you know, shout out to our guy, Boo, who did a whole video about this on his channel. Yeah, I got the slide. If you want to look at it. All right, cool. It says Tertullian supposedly, this is after he blocked you. This is right? after he right. Tertullian supposedly used the word Trinity in the concept based on linguistics. But the person spewing this nonsense <laughs> couldn't define Allahayim Elohim, which means council that includes Israel judges, Psalm 82, and angels. Right. So, <laughs> so he clearly was upset. And, uh, you know, he, he was taking shots at me even after he had booted me off of, of his, uh, or, you know, I guess, you know, blocked me or whatever, which I thought, you know, um, I'm, I'm not going to use the word that, that comes to mind, but I just, hmm. I, I think that manhood requires more uh, of us than that. You know, I, I'll just put it that way. You know I'm saying if you're going to stand on your square, just stay in your square. If you're going to talk spicy and people come to engage you in a public forum, when you initiate the conversation, then we shouldn't be, you know, throwing our rock and hiring our hand. I, I, don't, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Well, I, I think also it, it's to be more honest with your own um, triggers and self-awareness. You know, right. if you know that if someone pushes back on a claim that you made and you know you're not going to like that it's probably best for you to mo to make that claim in the public square right it's not the move right it's, you know but it's about you being honest with yourself this it's not a shot at him or anything like that it's like if you're not comfortable with people pushing back on a critique you're making on their belief you probably shouldn't make it publicly there's there's other venues and other mediums where you could be with like-minded individuals and you guys could bounce these ideas with one another and nobody will push back or critique you and you'll be fine but right. if you're going to do it in the public arena you have to expect some sort of blowback you just have to and if you don't like that which is fine you don't have to then you probably shouldn't do it because then it's just going to hurt you at the end right you know that's a fact saying? It, it, I like how you said that, man. It's, it's that self awareness, you know. Um, because I, I know my, I know me. Um, if if I say something online, that, particularly if it's controversial, if I get pushed back on it, I mean, okay, I, I mean, I said it. I'm, I'm right. either gonna stand on it, or somebody's gonna prove me wrong, and I just, I just had to be wrong, you know. But I can't get offended if somebody <laughs> responds to, to something that I say publicly. I think that's just silly, man. But. Anyway, you know, that, that's kind of how that went down. You know, he, he booted me off. Uh, I guess our lunch plans have been canceled. You know, we're supposed <laughs> to be, you know, you know, getting together. I guess that's not going to happen. Uh, but nevertheless, it's given us an opportunity uh, to, to talk about how great God is in his Trinitarian, um, you know, self. And, and um, you know, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with taking the occasion to do that. So, yeah, man, what you got coming down the uh, down the pipe, bro? Um, I mean, I'm always, you know, working on some something. I don't have anything in particular right now. 
but uh I got a couple things, you know, on on the on the burner. So let's see what comes out first. <laughs> okay, okay, cool, yeah. cool, cool. I, I think last time he was on the channel, uh, we was talking about the Kendrick and, and Drake situation. You know, I, I got some some interesting comments from that. So we might have to you know spin the block. You know, next time I guess there's a prominent beef <laughs> in the hip hop world, which you know may not be too far in the future. I don't know. I mean, Cat Williams, you know, put everybody on notice that this was the year that people were getting called out. So I, maybe we can right. expect for something to pop off here pretty soon. You, I, I don't you know. Never know. You never know. You never know, man. So anyway, y'all know what it is, man. Appreciate y'all riding with us. Uh, True idea apologetics. We are back at it, and uh, you know, definitely hit that like button, subscribe, go to the website, check out the podcast. The whole nine, man. But as always, love God, love people, take care of the things that God blesses you with, and think on these things. Peace.